today about experience uh, on this topic. Uh, let me introduce uh, uh, some of the Excuse me, Devin. Uh, uh, the sound, the sound we, we are not hearing you very well. Uh, can you kindly maybe uh, take you. the video for so the, the network can walk well? Repeat it again. The video yeah. So the, the network All right. Work well. All right. Yeah. Thank you so yes. much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Now you can hear me Thank well. You. Thank you. Yes. Do you? Yes. Yes, yes. All right, thank yes, you so much. Yeah. Uh, yes. uh, so may I start again or? I start again or? You can start if okay. you don't mind. All right, all right, thank you so much. Um, uh, I was actually uh, welcoming you and uh, saying good morning to everyone who is listening to me and um, welcoming you uh, to this wonderful event organized by ARA GSD. Uh, dedicated to the International Day for Universal Access to Information uh, mm -hmm. Celebrations in Rwanda. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, you are welcome at this special conference, and we wish you a happy International Day for Universal Access to Information. My name is Divin Keshimana, as I told you. Uh, I'm a member of uh, RGSD, in particular, I'm, a, I'm the club representative mm -hmm. uh, in RGSD. I'm the one who is going to host this uh, conference and lead the discussions today. Um, allow me to first outline all the program uh, agenda of today. We are going to follow uh, in this discussion. Excuse me, I would like to remind everyone to mute uh, his mic. All right, thank you so much. Yes, um, and uh, allow me to first outline all the program uh, agenda of, of today. We are going to, with that, we are going to follow uh, in today's discussions. Our discussion will be focusing on the theme chosen by UNESCO, entitled uh, the, right to, the Right to Know and Building Back Better with Access to Information. Allow me to repeat it again, the right to know and building back better with access to information. Uh, our panelists and guest speakers we have today have a lot of experience on this topic and uh, you're gonna allow, allow me to introduce them to you. Uh, we have Mr. Uh, John Okande from uh, Communication and Information Sector at the UNESCO Regional Office for Eastern uh, African based in uh, Africa based in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, Mr. Gilbert Sendugwa, the program manager at AFIC, Africa Freedom of Information Center a Pan-African membership-based civil society network and a resource center promoting the right of access to information, transparency, and accountability across Africa. We also have Mr. Emmanuel Mugisha, the Executive Secretary of RIMC, Rwanda Media Commission, uh, Ms. Uh, Berna Namata, the Chief Editor at the East African Newspaper based in Kigali, uh, Mr. Emmanuel Hawamuremi, the Executive Secretary of ARG, Rwanda Association of Journalists, which is Rwanda Associations of Journalists, and, um, uh, and Mr. John um, uh, Mudakikwa, uh, a lawyer and Executive uh, Director at Selura uh, Center for Rule of Law, Rwanda. And we also have Mr. Samuel Bekaviancy, co founder of M28 Investigates Media Organization. Distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have the different uh, delegates who have come to represent their institutions and organizations. We also have journalists from different media houses, including RGSD members and uh, media clubs members. All of you, you are welcome. And thank you so much for your time uh, to join us. Um, allow me, uh, let me uh, immediately request uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Placide Girinshuti, a legal representative of RGSD, to first welcome us and then uh, help me to welcome Mr. John Okande uh, from the Commission uh, Communication and uh, Information Sector at the UNESCO Region Office for Eastern Africa as an invitee who will deliver uh, a special address to us uh, that will open our discussion. Thank you so much, uh, please, Placid, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much. Proceed. Can you unmute yourself? Huh? Sorry. Okay. Thank you so much, Devin, our moderator of today. Dear guest, Mr. John Okande, UNESCO representative, Mr. Gilbert Sendurwa from Africa Freedom of Information Center, Mr. Emmanuel Mujisha, the, the, the executive secretary of RMC, Mrs. Banana Mata, the chief editor of uh, the East African, based in Kigali, Mr. Emmanuel Abumuremi, the executive secretary of IRG, Mr. John Mudachikwa, the executive director at CELULA, representative from international and local organization, NGOs, civil societies, and private sectors, fellows journalists, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Prasidi Nishuti. I'm legal representative of RGSD, as Devin mentioned. And I'm Rwandan journalist with the experience of more, uh, of more 10 years in media and communication in Rwanda. On behalf of my organization, RGSD, I would like to extend my warm welcome to all guests to this conference as part of the International Day of the Universal Access Information Celebration in Rwanda. Dear guests, I welcome you to this virtual conference and public discussion. This is the second edition of RGSD conference regarding to the advocacy, awareness, and promoting the right of access, uh, of access to information. The first, uh, the first such activity was carried out in March this year. Such activities are intended to raise awareness about the right of access to information and remind everybody the benefits from the right of access to information. As part of our main goal in RGSD, we want Rwanda and other African countries to achieve sustainable development through to access information at the right time. Steam request, your presence here is testimony of our partnership and your support, as well as our strong commitment to fight, to the, to, to fight for the right to information. Lack of citizen access to information continue to hamper the, the realization of sustainable development in Africa. We are a GSD call on everyone to abide by the law on access to information, as it the one tools of accelerating the sustainable development of the country. The access to information is thus not only important for individual dignity, but also for participation, accountability, and democracy. Distinguished guests, ladies, and gentlemen, as I mentioned before, in RGSD, we already have a project to campaign on the access information law. Some of the activities of this project include public, uh, public, public discussion like this, debates, workshop, trainings, creation and increasing media contents, radio and uh, television talk shows, and awareness raising sessions for everyone involved by the access to information law, such as the community, local leaders, journalists, and students from universities. In this project, we also plan to conduct a special, special research and assessment on the challenge that remain in the implementation of access to information law in Rwanda in, in order to find a solution uh, that should address the ongoing challenges. But to implement uh, all those activity, it requires a lot of resource and so far, it is a challenge of uh, in RGSD, but we hope that our collaboration with you uh, and uh, other collaboration gives hope that uh, we those funds will be available, even all the project will be implemented. Ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude by thanking uh, by thanking everyone who was able to accept our invitation of today. I'd like to thank you very much to you to UNESCO Regional Office for the East Africa, based in Nairobi, Kenya, for sending its invoice to join us in this celebration of International Day for a Universal Access to Information. In this context, that I would like to welcome Mr. John Okande, and I would like to request him to tell us something on those celebrations of International Day for Universal Access to Information as it already being organized by UNESCO at the international level. Thank you so much. And Mr. John Okande, 
You are welcome. The time is yours. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Placid. Can you hear me? I hope you can hear me. Yes, we are hearing you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Placid and team. And uh, thank you, colleagues, uh, uh, distinguished guests and uh, partners um, in this movement of uh, advancing and promoting access to information principles. Uh, within our countries and also globally. As uh, rightly mentioned by Placid that uh, today is the International Day for Universal Access to Information. The celebrations are ongoing uh, globally and also nationally in different countries uh, um, across uh, uh, Africa and also globally. Um, UNESCO, we have a global event going on. We have a sub-regional event um, uh, hosted from Eastern Africa, that is the UNESCO regional office. Um, and also from different parts of the Western Africa, uh, Southern Africa, um, are also having events. And uh, we, we appreciate the fact that uh, you extended an invitation to us to join you. And we are happy to be with you uh, here today. And uh, I'll quickly go to um, a message uh, we prepared uh, uh, in this regard. Uh, and um, it's critical to note that uh, in times of crisis, uh, like now, for example, the COVID pandemic, uh, information saves life, lives. And we've seen this in various response mechanisms um, that national institutions, private sector, um, and, and even governments and uh, donor community have been able to rally others to come together and, and support uh, in responding to this uh, uh, crisis. And in many countries, uh, uh, this crisis has shown that access to accurate and timely information can be a matter of life to death um, in various forms. I think we've seen uh, um, uh, new elements coming in, misinformation, disinformation, malinformation, particularly on uh, the pandemic and also the response mechanisms, be it vaccination and other uh, uh, modalities that are coming up. Access to information also makes it possible for citizens to follow responses to the crisis, such as confinement rules, regulations of traveling and schooling, virus testing, medical equipment supplies, economic aid or stimulus packaging. This just reiterates the fact that access to information is critical. It's a matter of life, life and death. But remember also that this is not limited only to citizens or the public. Information is also necessary, a necessary resource for governments in effective management of public health. This, uh, particularly the response mechanisms for coming up with requisite policies and strategies to address or uh, mitigate uh, what we are currently in the pandemic. For example, in controlling the outbreaks as we, as well as mitigating the economic setbacks that come with the pandemic, like what we have. On this day, UNESCO uh, is partnering with the rest of uh, the world, that is the UN family, uh, private sector organization, um, public institutions, um, uh, the media and governments um, to acknowledge that this right as a key to enabling broader access to data information and knowledge and empowering citizens in their efforts to build brighter futures. In as much as access to information has proved essential in saving lives, COVID has also given rise to viral disinformation that threatens the very foundations of open and democratic societies. I think this is evident in different contexts, um, particularly in Africa, and we've seen uh, how disinformation has threatened um, uh, the very foundations of, for open democracies. Um, it has also shown that people are susceptible to falsehoods about COVID-19 and the various conspiracy theories that have come up um, about or against the pandemic. Uh, with this in mind, this calls for concerted effort among partners, be it private sector, non-state actors, government, to build the resilience of our citizens through media information literacy. And this can be in form of coming up with strategies and policies that would anchor the response mechanisms that we have in our different countries. 
but also strengthening or sensitizing the citizenry with requisite competencies to be able to identify and, and be able to flag out what is not authentic information. And in this regard, UNESCO, uh, we've been uh, implementing uh, uh, interventions uh, globally and particularly in the region. Uh, where we've partnered with uh, European Union and other partners to implement a number of interventions to build community resilience to falsehood. And this is through campaigns such as Think Before Sharing, uh, Stop the Spread of Conspiracy Theories, and also the Coronavirus Fact. And in particular, uh, Coronavirus Fact, uh, where we've been able to support the media sector uh, by empowering journalists uh, with fact-checking skills and uh, that is online and offline, just to be able to uh, acquire the requisite skills and competencies to uh, do their work well amidst the pandemic. In particular in Rwanda, we worked closely with the Rwanda Media Council uh, to strengthen media pluralism online by reinforcing and increasing capacities of journalists, uh, bloggers, and online media publishers on responsible reporting and publishing news about COVID-19 pandemic uh, in Rwanda. Also in Rwanda, we've been able to uh, strengthen capacities of information and communication officers for public and private institutions on how to monitor and report on uh, uh, SDG indicator 16.10 Point two, and this is on access to information and looking more precisely at how to evaluate relevant national legislations vis-a-vis -vis, uh, international human rights standards and the available implementation mechanisms within the Rwandan context. So this is just um, one, two key critical elements that we've been able to work closely with Rwanda stakeholders uh, that, uh, uh, in Rwanda. And uh, just a message from our Director General, and I quote um, in, uh, in relation to uh, uh, this day, is that access to reliable information saves life. Misinformation and rumors can cost them. This is simple lesson. This simple lesson is one we have to learn to our detriment in recent years. Whether fighting a global pandemic or supporting public debate, we need free, reliable, independent information as, a, as the foundation upon which democratic societies are built. And in this respect, uh, end of quote, and in this respect, it is important for us to all note while marking this day that universal access to information is a basic human right and must be legally protected. So in all our response mechanisms and initiatives, we need to always try and uphold the basic human rights and advance principles that fall within this summit. Secondly, universal access to information is a key pillar for resilient and inclusive knowledge societies and sustainable development. Uh, we also need to acknowledge that access to information is a key driver for achievement of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And in particular, SDG 16, which talks of promoting just peaceful and inclusive societies. We also need to acknowledge the fact that societies need oversight bodies, such as the International Conference of Information Commission, that are independent and effective and must be strengthened to enable fostering the protection and promotion of access to information. Uh, access to public information as a fundamental pillar for social, economic, and democratic uh, governance. Uh, we also need, during this celebration, to acknowledge the fact that international cooperation, like now what we have, is needed in the field of access to information for the environment, health, and human rights. That is because the right to access to information contributes to ensuring that decisions are taken in the best interest of humanity and that of the planet. And we applaud uh, what, uh, uh, what your organization, Placid, and partners are doing in Rwanda. And also, lastly, we need to look at, uh, acknowledge the fact that right to information is also vital to, uh, in development of free, independent, and pluralistic media. Uh, uh, this is because it's essential to strengthen media capacities to counter uh, false information, for example, 
uh, misleading information, counter hate speech, and also provide mechanisms for promotions of inter intercultural understanding, and to a, a larger extent help fight radicalization and violent extremism. So on this day, we reaffirm our commitment that is as UNESCO to promoting and supporting member states um, uh, and countries to constitutional and statutory guarantees for ac access to information in the continent. And as you rightly know that uh, in Africa, we have 26 countries out of 54 that have access to information law. Um, more work needs to be done. And out of these seven are from Eastern Africa. So this indicates that we still have work to do in as much as we are supporting interventions nationally to advance these principles. We need also to have best practices that can be replicated or borrowed from uh, in other countries in our region that have not been able to come up with access to information law. At UNESCO, we firmly believe that access to information must be recognized as a pillar of sustainable development and as a prerequisite for promotion and protection of all human rights. As we adapt our societies to face common challenges, the right to information must be at the center of the efforts to ensure a more informed and a resilient tomorrow. Thank you. And that's the end of my opening remarks. Thank you, Placid. Over to you and the MC. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. John Okande. And thank you for uh, reminding us uh, a lot more and um, and strengthening uh, and strengthening with a media high council, uh, the media pluralism online and uh, offline. Uh, so please, uh, thank you. And uh, please, we'll be happy to stay with you, uh, Mr. John Okande. We'd like to stay with you in a second in second uh, in second session. We'll still need you there. Uh, we we'll still need to hear more from you. Thank you so much. And um, I'd like to excuse, uh, I've mentioned uh, Mr. Gilbert Sendungwa, but uh, it's not him, it's uh, Mr. Matthew Simwesige from AFIC. Thank you so much. Uh, that was the correction. Um, so uh, allow me uh, to welcome um, again on the for, on, on to the panelists. Uh, thank you very much, actually, for your kind words uh, with Placid, and thank you uh, very much for your official launching uh, of our launch and uh, conversation today. And allow me to welcome Ms. Uh, Berna Namata, who is going to be the first speaker uh, to share with us her points and uh, facts on sub uh, subtopic related to access to real information as a public good fighting disinformation and uh, fake news. Uh, but um, before I give her the floor, let me first introduce you, who is Berna Namata. She's, uh, uh, she's, she currently works for the National Media Group's popular regional weekly newspaper, the East, Afri the East, the East African. She's a chief editor based in Kigali at the East African newspaper. She has more than 10, 10 years experience as a print journalist graduated uh, school in uh, 2016 as a uh, as achieving scholar scholar at city uh, university of london she's also the africa specialist at thompson foundation of uk so ladies and gentlemen please join me to welcome miss uh, berna namata on the floor berna you're most welcome thank you, can you hear yes me? hello you can hear me Yes, 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 uh, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, 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 yeah. all right. So, Berna Namata, okay. according um, to your experience, we would like to hear uh, how you feel about the access to information here in Rwanda and tell us how you think about the growing uh, disinformation problematic in Rwanda and abroad, yeah, and how you think it can be resolved. Thank you, the floor is yours. Okay, I will briefly turn on my video uh, for those sure. who have not met and then I'll turn it off because I'm not sure of my, my connection. Yes, um, yes, yeah, so thank you so much uh, for, for this opportunity. Uh, for me, it's really exciting when I see um, young people taking the lead uh, 
in initiatives like this um, because it points to the future. So Devine and uh, Placid and the team, I'm very proud of you and thank you so much uh, for putting this mm -hmm. together. Um, I'm going to switch off my video now uh, so that I focus on the presentation. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I will limit my comments to the, pra the practical aspects of uh, access to information. Uh, the topic you have given me is access to real information as a public good, uh, fighting disinformation and fake news. So allow me to begin by defining some of the keywords uh, in this um, topic of mine. One, public good. Uh, public good, I think, if I'm not mistaken, that statement would have been borrowed from economics. And by public good, essentially we mean a good that is both non-excludable and non-rivalous. For instance, um, users cannot be barred from accessing them or using them for failing to pay them. So when we talk of a public good, I want you to imagine uh, something like that. We are saying, when we say information is a public good, that means we feel that anybody should be able to access information without paying for it and should be able to access it easily. The other term I would like to also define is disinformation. This information is when people intentionally create false or misleading information to make money or have political influence or to maliciously cause trouble or harm. I'll repeat it again. This information, when people intentionally that's the keyword, intentionally create false or misleading information to make money or have political influence or to maliciously cause trouble or harm. And why do people share disinformation? It could be for money again, political gain, or cause confusion or so mistrust. Now, Disinformation should not be confused with misinformation. When we talk about misinformation, again, let me clarify that. Misinformation is when people share disinformation, but don't realize it's false or misleading because they are trying to help or feel part of a community. And why would people share disinformation? perhaps out of fear, or they want to protect people they care about. So it is very important that we make a distinction between disinformation and misinformation. I think those are the key words in uh, the, the topic that you have given me. So I hope we have an understanding of um, what it is. Now, coming back to Rwanda, we have had, uh, as an industry, as, as journalists, I think we are benefiting from a set of reforms uh, over the last, uh, we have benefited from a set of reforms over the last, uh, close to a decade actually. Uh, if you look at the amendments that were done to the, uh, to the media law, removing uh, defamation and the access to information law. The access to information law benefits not just journalists, but also citizens. Remember, we are saying that information is a public good. So in the Rwandan context, I can confidently say that over the last um, 10 years, we've seen uh, a progressive, uh, progressive legislations that are helping or should help journalists. And I think the challenge that we have now is the gaps in implementation and how we enforce uh, implementation i think remains key 
because again, it is not enough to just have legislation, but also to ensure that it is being effectively implemented. Now, that is also a big uh, debate, uh, but I, I wanted us to recognize that over the last uh, couple of years, we've really benefited from a set of progressive um, laws as an industry that ideally in, you know, if effectively implemented would facilitate free flow of information and would enable um, citizens to be able to see um, information as a public good. Now, going to our responsibility as, as, as journalists, we've seen that um, if we take the pandemic uh, as an example, uh, and again, like the representative from UNESCO um, mentioned, we saw that during the pandemic, the role of journalists became more critical, but also information became a matter of life and death. Now, the key gap there, what we saw from the pandemic was that first of all, even journalists uh, ourselves were not really informed about COVID. So it was not surprising that we also had journalists that were spreading uh, fake news and in the business of disinformation. Uh, perhaps not because they were they wanted to have money or influence, but because they were not informed. So as practitioners, as we push for the right to information, we need to think about the need for us to be better informed. Because if we are better informed, then one, we can effectively claim the right to information that is needed to empower uh, citizens. The other thing I would like to mention is in the Rwandan context, we saw over the last um, uh, 12 months or so, we saw that during the pandemic, again, information was uh, largely controlled uh, by government. And I think this was, this was the same elsewhere uh, because of the technicalities of, of the pandemic. Uh, for most of us, it was the first time. And we saw that uh, the Rwanda Biomedical Center, for instance, was quite proactive in terms of uh, providing information. Now, on one hand, that was uh, very helpful for, for journalists. But on the other hand, what we have seen is that uh, journalists appear to have uh, gone for the comfort, you know, taken comfort and forget and forgotten about their role in terms of interrogating some of the information that is given by government ag agencies. There is a gap there, and I think it continues uh, because um, again, we recognize that for most journalists during the pandemic, it was difficult to move, um, to be closer to sources and, and ask them. Uh, but I think now uh, what we should be thinking about also is the is that we need to get back to work, get back to the field and provide reliable information. Part of the theme for this year is building back better, the right to know. And I think for me, we cannot think about building resilient communities without information. A better informed citizenry, in my view, can only come out of access to information that enables them to make better decisions. So when we talk about resilience, I think access to information is going to be a critical part of that. The other aspect I would like to cover is How can we do better in terms of fighting disinformation? The beginning point, as far as I'm concerned, is for journalists to be better informed, because when you're better informed as a journalist, you ask better questions, you write better stories, your talk shows or whatever you're working on is better. So if we are to empower citizens with information, I feel that as journalists, 
um, on this platform, we must do better in terms of informing ourselves. On fake news, we've seen that on one hand, technology has democratized the flow of information. There are increased opportunities to you know, access to information. People access information at, on different platforms, most of it on social media. But we also see that most of this information on social media is not just created by journalists, but also citizens themselves. And what that has done is create a fertile ground for disinformation and also fake news. What this means for us as, as journalists, as practitioners, is to see how we, one, become more obsessive about, about fact checking. If you're going to inform the general public as a journalist, you must prioritize verification over breaking news. It is going to be very important. Again, as we fight for the right to improve the access to information, I feel that as professionals, we have to do better. And part of that is making sure that we verify information uh, before we publish it. We verify information before we share it even on our platforms on social media. I would like to conclude by focusing on the importance of reliable information. As the pandemic has demonstrated, you know, before the pandemic, we saw that um, there wasn't so much focus on, on journalism. Uh, journalism uh, has faced several challenges over the last couple of years, whether it's sustainability, limited access to revenues, and this has really affected, especially local media in terms of producing original stories. Now, as we say, uh, and information is a public good, my appeal to agencies, um, partners that may be able to support media houses, I think it is important to also think about the viability of, of, of media because producing well-researched well stories, uh, whether for print or television or radio costs money. So as we think about the right of information, it is important that we also think about empowering newsrooms to be able to produce this information. Thank you so much. I'm happy to take any questions. All right, thank you so much, uh, Berna. Uh, thank you for reminding, reminding and your clarification on the terms you made. Uh, above and uh, thank you for being an inspiration to young ladies who are in this random media and they are learning a lot from you, uh, including me, by the way. Yeah, so thank you so much. And um, uh, thank you uh, for your wonderful points you gave us and uh, we hope that others uh, have also benefited a lot. And by reminding everyone I'm calling everyone to, to share their comments or to ask, uh, uh, to write their questions in box. Uh, and uh, please uh, remember uh, to, um, uh, to mention uh, to whom you are addressing your question, uh, to whom you're uh, addressing your question to. So thank you so much. And um, while about the access to information, we would like to know how the laws on uh, access to information uh, can accelerate the development of various countries as a part of uh, the UN objectives through in sustainable development goals known as SDGs. Um, and we would like to see how these laws should contribute to SDGs and more uh, specifically and uh, of indicators SDGs 16.10.2 on public access to information. Uh, forgetting more uh, about this, I would like to invite Mr. Matthew Mwesige from AFIC, Africa uh, Freedom of Information Center, 
uh, to come and uh, share uh, more about uh, what uh, he prepared for us today. And I would like um, uh, to, uh, to mention to you or to introduce to you a FIC. Uh, what is a FIC? Is a, a Pan African uh, membership based civil society network and a resource center promoting the right of access to information, transparency, and accountability across uh, Africa. And AFIC was first registered in uh, 2007 in Nigeria. AFIC is also a network of more than 46 civil society organizations, members from across uh, 23 countries. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, help me to welcome Mr. Matthew Mwesige from um, AFIC, of course. Um, uh, hello, are you there? Hello. Is uh, Mr. Matthew there? Okay. Placid is uh, Matthew in? Yes, as I can see him. Uh, Matthew, you're welcome. The time is yours. I think your microphone is uh, is not working well. You should, uh, Mr. Matthews, you should check your microphone. We are not hearing you. You can check where your microphone. So... I think Mr. Matthews uh, is, uh, has a problem of the network. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, should, we, should, we should go to the next, the next topic okay. uh, from someone like John Dachikwa. I see, the, I see him there mm. for, for waiting, Mr. Matthews, for more prepared. Okay. Good morning. Okay. Okay. All right. No, you, you should you okay. 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 even you should do you should go to the next uh, speaker like Emmanuel Omremi is ready and you uh, you can uh, you you can give him the floor for waiting for Mr. Matthews prepared before. Well, okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, allow me actually to uh, to return here in Rwanda and see how uh, and see how um, this law can help uh, a country, our country, to accelerate uh, the sustainable uh, development goals. Uh, some of the most affected by this uh, law are journalists. Uh, journalists are also at the forefront of implementing the law. We would like to know how random journalists are uh, commenting on this law excuse through me, the associations, me, uh, including ARSD. Yes, the message, message is already, she said, he said he's, he's already, so maybe you can, uh, take, you can uh, consider him before you continue. Thank you. He says he's ready now. Oh. Ready now. Okay, if he's ready now, okay, thank you so much. Uh, so, um, thank Mr. Matthews, uh, thank you for being there. We are so glad to have you. And um, uh, as I proceed, uh, we know that in Africa, in African countries, there are some that, uh, that have uh, already ratified and, uh, uh, and voted on access to information laws, including Rwanda, including Rwanda, yeah. But there are other countries that do not have these laws. What do you, as a FIC, uh, think about the fact that this law would help the countries to accelerate uh, their development, uh, as I said, including Rwanda? Yeah. And you can also tell us uh, what the difference is uh, between countries that adopted and signed this law and those countries who do not ha have it in accelerating development. So thank you, uh, Mr. Matthews. The floor is yours. Thank you.
Celestine, are you sure? Yes. Uh, really? Mr. Matthews, I think you can uh, increase the volume of the, the computer, the volume, increase the volume. All right, thank you. You're welcome, Mr. Matthews. Is someone called Shanti? Shanti should, should put your mic on. Okay. Matthews, you can go ahead, please. Mr. Matthews, can you unmute your microphone and proceed? Uh, uh, Celestine, uh, I think uh, I think we can uh, take uh, Mr. Emmanuel Habumi. Meanwhile, uh, meanwhile, um, he's preparing uh, himself. What do you think? Yeah, sure. Please, yeah, take Mr. the Matthew, next. Matthews, yeah, uh, he's he's preparing. Yeah. So um, I was saying that. Um, uh, that uh, we are we are getting back here to Rwanda, in Rwanda and see uh, how this law, law can, can help our country, country to accelerate the sustainable development goals. And, and some, some of, of the most affected area by this area, law, by this are, we know that. Are and uh, journalists are also at the front. And uh, journalists are also at the front. We would like to know how random journalists like are commenting uh, on this law uh, through their the, uh, association. Which is uh, Association of Random Journalists in English. And uh, we have Mr. English. Of course, uh, Emmanuel uh, Hawamuyemi, uh, uh, the executive uh, secretary of ARG. Uh, uh, actually, before that, he received our love to uh, share his ARG, uh, body that represents more than 500 random journalists and media practitioners. Um, uh, it, it was found, founded in 1995 with a mission of campaigning for the interests of uh, random journalists, striving for gre greater pre press freedom, media professionalism, and better working conditions for journalists. Uh, ARG also has been uh, respon uh, responsible for putting in place the journalists' code of, con of conduct in conjunction with other association um, uh, and uh, so uh, help me to welcome uh, Mr. Emmanuel Habumuyemi. The floor is yours. Thank you, Devin. Thank you. Yes, thank you. My and, name is uh, Emmanuel Habumuyemi, as you mentioned, uh, secre uh, Executive Secretary of Rwanda Journalist Association, ARJ. Uh, before talking to the point you, uh, you have, the topic you have given me, I would like to introduce myself. Uh, I hold a master's degree in media and communication from the University of Leicester. Uh, before coming to the ARJ, I have served the government as an advice to the minister from the Minister of Youth in 2012, uh, Minister of ICT, uh, Minister of ICT and Communication and Mini ICT. Uh, and I, I served uh, as the, among the first uh, uh, staff of the Media High Council when it was created in 2003 as a media monitor. And from that time, I have followed the process on access to information uh, law uh, promulgation. Uh, before the law, there was the problem of accessing uh, public information. Uh, my presentation is going to, uh, it's a kind of uh, uh, an overview on access to information in general, in Rwanda and in Africa, and then some challenges people are met, meeting and 
uh, and after we will draw a kind of uh, uh, action step to take. Uh, you can go to the second uh, slide, which is uh, a slide on content. Yeah, this presentation where we will have uh, an introduction. Uh, we will talk about access to information in Africa, access to information in Rwanda, policy environment here in Rwanda, legislative environment, access to information in action, some myth and the reality, access to information and development, some challenges or gaps which are there, and action step. On the introduction, uh, we, be, we live in, in the world governed by information. Area you get to the source of information, much you bear the strong trust with your audience. Thus, quicken the sustainable development. Access to information is a human right and should be treated as such. Institutions should be, should do everything, everything they can, and all actors should pull their effort to ensure that right, all the sectors have to bear responsibilities. These was some of the positions stated, uh, stated by the, the government of Rwanda when uh, uh, His Excellency the President was addressing the Geneva World Summit on Information Society that took place in 2003. Access to information in Africa. As you know, we have African Charter on Human, uh, on human and uh, People's Rights. Uh, this charter mentioned that uh, uh, provide in Article 9 the right of every individual uh, to receive information. In 2002, uh, the African Commission on Human and People's Rights adopted the Declaration of, uh, of Principles of Freedom of Expression in Africa to accelerate Article 9 of the Charter. The Declaration provided that freedom of expression and information including right to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas, either orally, in writing or in print, in the form of art or though any other form of communication, including across frontiers, is the fundamental and inalienable human right and indispensable component of democracy. Moreover, the declaration uh, stipulated that public bodies hold information not for themselves, but as a custodian of the public good, and everyone has the right to access this information, subject only to clear defined rules established by the law. Uh, this uh, uh, last point sometimes hinder fully access to the information. The African Forum held at the 20, 2021 World Press Freedom Day Global Conference in Windhoek, Namibia, on the 30th, 30th of April, called upon African government to adopt a democratic piece of legis legislation that guarantee access to information for all citizens. Come back to Rwanda. After 1994, Rwanda faced challenges of dealing with citizens' mistrust in information sharing, government to citizens, media to audience, etc., due to aftermath of the genocide against Tutsi. The government made a commitment to promote access to information for the sake of development of the country to improve social welfare and foster national reconciliation and unity. The coming of the internet in the end of 90s marked the beginning of new era for Rwandan citizens, whose door to inform were closed because of a bureaucratic government and fake news that would emerge around that situation. 
information and communication technologies, ICTs, came as one of the key enablers for the country's transformation where access to information equals access to education and knowledge in order to stimulate innovation. For media sector, this was the solution on delayed information as a channel leading to the source were widened. Looking at the policy environment, the SDGs 16.10 aim to ensure public access to information and protect fundamental freedoms in accordance with the national reg legislation and the international agreement. Access to information goes hand in hand with the freedom of opinion, which is a constitutional right for Rwanda. Article 38 of the constitution states that freedom of, of the press, of expression and access to information are recognized and guaranteed by the state. The increased public de uh, demand for more openness, agility, transparency and accountability for public data and action led to uh, the public uh, the publication of data revolution policy adopted in, in April 2017. It has a section dealing with open data, open data are uh, data to the public with, with no restriction. Open data only works when every agency allow the same standards and when personal, personal identifying information is protected from the release. Under open data spectrum, specified the set of personal, commercial, and government data, which can be accessible through different layers of access, including internal access, named access, group-based access, public access, and those which can be accessed by anyone. With the national strategy for transformation number one in its priority area number six, Various development partners introduced programs to reinforce technical capacity of media institution aimed at increasing citizens' participation and engagement in development, democratic government, and improving their social welfare. Here, uh, allow me to mention that uh, uh, Swedish uh, uh, Development Corporation through UNDP uh, has uh, supported the media uh, on this area. When we look at uh, legislative environment, uh, in Rwanda access to information is granted under the article mentioned before, and there are uh, some laws uh, like access to information law uh, uh, adopted in 2013. Uh, and other ministerial order that were promulgated to guide the implementation of the law. The law enacted to permit the public and the journalists to access information possessed by public organs and some private bodies. Here, uh, I have mentioned some uh, five ministerial orders. Uh, the one that pertain to information which could destabilize national uh, security. The other that determines in details the information to, to be disclosed. The other determining the time limit for provision of information or explanation of, non -provide, of, not, of not providing it. The other pertains to procedure of charges or fees related to access to information. And the other one uh, that provide categories which uh, private organs, uh, the law related to access to information Thanks. applies. Yes. Mr. Emmanuel, uh, yes. you're remaining with three minutes. Thank you. Yes, access to information and in action, myth and reality, following uh, the 2013 promulgation of access to information in, law, uh, in Rwanda, Article 19 stated that the law show that the Rwandan government is keen to entrench transparency and accountability as, uh, as well as enhancing greater participation by citizens in the management of public affairs. It denotes that the law has some broad exemption where access to information may restrict 
in relation to national security and administration of justice and trade secret. Rwanda was the 11th uh, country in Africa to adopt the access to information law. In the eyes of some Rwandan media professionals, the question is whether the access to information law is serving its purpose. This question raised by Angel Riza, Iriza and Nasra Bishumba in, in, uh, in, in 2019 in New Times. For them, the law to be effective, it needs to be widely explained to the government institutions and particularly local authorities. Narrative concerning uh, the access to information law, globally for what becomes disturbing familiar patterns punctuated with, uh, uh, with words uh, broke and dysfunction and uh, useless, revealing uh, this was revealed by Henry Maina uh, through Thompson Foundation activity here in Rwanda. Access to information development. Paul Kagame, uh, while at delivering a keynote address at the 50 East African Media Summit, Kigali, 19, uh, 9th August 2012, he said, in order to nurture media, all partners, be the government and the private sector, have the responsibility to invest in it and raise professional and ethical standards for the media to tell African story, where it has to have access to the right information and the freedom to disseminate it. Recognizing that the media plays a, a critical role in shaping national, regional, and the global politics, uh, politics, economics, and diplomacy. He affirmed that the East African integration process lies to the roles of the media in advancing the visibility of the East African community and a better understanding of regional integration issues. Some challenges, uh, one of the biggest gap in, uh, in Rwanda access to information law is the lack of pen penalty for breach of the law. 2013 access to information law is silent with regard to penalties for breach of a provision on access to information, and the law lacks clear complaint mechanisms. Accent uh, uh, for conclusion, uh, we need to have some action to take. Uh, as we have seen, there are some gaps in the law and human capacity building. So despite progress recorded in access to information law, several steps need to be taken regarding the policy and regulatory framework, as well as access to information providers at the right time and human capacity building. For the language barrier, Rwanda is a quadrilingual country where in Rwanda, English, French, and English are used as official languages. Channels used to communicate information to the public are not always suited to the local needs and relevant to local content. Uh, which remains a uh, key constraint. Uh, the other issue is related uh, action to be taken is related to information security. Uh, securing access to service should be seen both as a question of delivering uh, them and empowering the community to access uh, uh, information in order to effectively secure broader development benefit. Uh, I thank you for your uh, attention, uh, but also thanking the, the, the association to uh, have organized this uh, event. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Emmanuel Ahawin. Thank you for... Um, uh, thank you for the exceptional opinions that you gave us, uh, and we hope that others have also helped a lot. And um, and uh, I, would, I would like to remind again to call everyone to keep uh, sending your questions or uh, other opinions uh, that you've uh, prepared for us. And please remember in chat box, of course, and uh, please remember to mention to whom you address to your question. Yeah, so, and I would like to again wish you a happy day of international uh, universal access to information. And uh, I would like actually to remind you again that uh, um, to remind you about the event that we had uh, in, uh, in past and uh, previous month, uh, like in, uh, 
in May and in, in July, uh, where in May on 4th, we had um, an event about fighting misinformation on vaccine. And um, another one we had on 27th July about uh, public mentoring, uh, also uh, about uh, fighting misinformation. But also uh, to say that we can't fight misinformation when we don't have access to the information. So I would like to request is, um, is uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mwesige now available or Matthews, I'm um, sorry, Matthews Mwesige. Is he available now? Yes, I can sp speak now. All right, all right, thank you. We're so glad to have you. Yeah, so um, thank you and welcome back. Yes, um, I was saying that, um, about the access to information, uh, Mr. Matthew, uh, we would like to know how the laws on access to information can accelerate the development of various countries as a uh, part of the UN objectives through in sustainable development goals uh, known as SDGs. And uh, would like to uh, would like to see how these laws should contribute to SDGs and more specifically of indicators um, SDG 16.10.2 on public access to information. Forget, uh, forgetting more about this, I would like to invite you so that you can um, uh, share us more about it. Thank you so much. You're most welcome again. Thank you, Divine. All right, uh, thank you so much. Once again, I would like to apologize for the, for the not, for the network issues, but all in all, I'm here. So allow me, uh, before I make my presentation, uh, I will request I switch off my um, video, then I make a presentation. Thank you. Okay, um, as we celebrate the second EDUI, I'm delighted to be here and speak to you. I congratulate you upon reaching the second EDUI celebrations and at the same, uh, the right to know, building back better with access to information. Uh, the year 2021 20, edition of EDUI is not only the second commemoration of this International Day since its, since its uh, proclamation by the, by the National uh, United Nations General Assembly, but it takes place at the time when the world is responding to the impact of COVID-19. With limited information, about concrete plans for mass vaccination and strategies for opening up education centers that have been closed for over time in various countries. COVID-19 has overwhelmed countries and threatened all sectors. The pandemic has destabilized education, health, agriculture, and other sectors that's affecting the future for millions of children in Africa and the world at large. As we celebrate the second EDY, ladies and gentlemen, James Modoc once stated, I quote, information is the most valuable com commodity is, uh, information is the most valuable commodity in the world today. And this business is about giving people access to information that is relevant for their lives. I end the quote. Access to information, as, um, as already noted, is the difference between life and death. I would also like to add that um, 
access to information, is the oxygen for the realization of other rights, including the sustainable development goals. Governments, governments hold information not for themselves, but instead of, on behalf of the public. This means public institutions should disclose information to the citizens. Um, I would like also to note that uh, the national governments and public institutions were placed to provide citizens with information to help them realize sustainable development goals. That is a question. Are the national governments, public institutions, were placed to provide citizens with information to help realize sustainable development goals. Another question is, are governments still committed to the realization of sustainable development goals, 16, 10, 2, which talks about number of countries that are adopted and implement access to information laws. Currently in Africa, there are 26 countries that have adopted access to information laws. 29 African countries are still yet to enact access to information laws, thus affecting the commitment of the realization of the sustainable development goal, more especially looking at uh, 16.10.2. The Africa Union model on access to information provides for an important and independent impartial information commissions to promote, monitor, protect each, citizen, each citizen's right to information. Here are the oversight mechanisms, functional and facilitating information disclosure in the realization of the sustainable development goals. Are the appealing mechanisms still active to facilitate easy flow of information in the case the requesters appealed for information requested? The COVID-19 has caused havoc and impacted the national governments on realization of sustainable development goals. The question is how are we building back better with the access to information to realize the sustainable development goals? Are the national governments keeping individuals and society informed, better placed, resilient, and uh, resilient to, res to resist shocks to realize sustainable development goals? Public officials need to be knowledgeable about access to information provisions and their obligation to, pro and their obligation to disclose proactively and reactively. As already indicated above, that public institutions hold information not for themselves, but rather on behalf of citizens. It's very important to know that in realization of sustainable development goals, public institutions should disclose information to the public, both reactively and proactively. Proactively, I mean, when, when uh, the government entities disclose information without asking. So are the national governments, are public officials knowledgeable on their provision, on these provisions and the law and the obligations in the law. Is the information readily available in, pub in public institution complete and user-friendly? Is the information that is, uh, that is, help, is supposed to help us sust um, achieve sustainable development goals easily accessible? And if it is accessible, is it in user-friendly formats? 
Can we analyze this information and make informed choices on what we are supposed to undertake? How about record keeping practices within public institutions? Are public institutions keeping this information as for as and when to be accessed when it is needed to inform the realization to, pay, to take decisions that facilitate involvement in um, realization of sustainable development goals? Are the practices facilitating is a retrieval of the information? If I requested for the information today, are government entities and officials able to provide information within the required time? For example, here in Uganda, we have access to information law since 2005. The law says uh, we, can provide, we can access information within 21 days. If we are practicing journalism, shall we have to wait for 21 days to run a story? I think that's not. The information should be easily available and accessible. Um, I also will look at the information needs responding to issues on gender and inclusiveness. And the information sharing, does it cater for gender issues and inclusiveness? Are women, men, are youth, disabled are people with disabilities able to access information and participate in the development processes? Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, limited disclosure of information held by citizens frustrates citizens' participation in the, in the interventions that would uh, contribute to the realization of the sustainable development goals. If the information is not available, governance, good, we can't realize good governance. Go good governance looks as if, at efficiency, effectiveness, and economy and value for money. So if the information is not available, how shall we hold our governments accountable? In terms of service delivery, how shall we demand for improved service delivery if we don't have information? And it is through this service delivery that we shall attain the sustainable development goals. Uh, two weeks ago, I think not even two weeks ago, a week ago, in Uganda, um, the information we received that uh, we received information that about 67,000 COVID doses were bound to, uh, to, to get expired within the next two weeks. So is that information really important to us? Who is willing to go to get vaccinated with how are we going to be to vaccinate uh, 60,000 people within two, within two weeks? If the information was uh, readily available at the beginning, people would, have, people would have been vaccinated earlier, but we can't do that. Without information, are we able to monitor public contracts and see the realization of what we want to achieve. Um, limited information affects transparency and accountability within the government systems. Exemptions. If we still have exemptions that do not allow citizens to access information that they need to participate in decision-making process, then how we better placed to realize the sustainable development goals. Um, exemptions to write information should be clearly and narrowed down to specific subjects and strict to harmful and specific to harm and public interest. And this uh, exemption should also be done to meet the three-part test. Our citizens 
prepared to access information held by public institutions to contribute to the realization of sustainable development goals? Do citizens have capacity to request information? Information held by government, are citizens aware of the law so that they can request information to help them make the informed choices? Are citizens knowledgeable about the laws? How about journalists? Are the journalists playing the central role of information dissemination, avoiding misinformation and disinformation? Do they know the process of requesting information to guide them making better information and um, provide disseminate information to the grassroots people to participate in development processes and interventions? Are journalists able to ask right questions and verify the available information to aid the attainment of development goals? or the information that is given is just past the way how it is, are they able to analyze these information, then provide feedback to the community? The decision-making process at all levels depend on the quality of the information available. The decision-making processes at all levels depend on the quality of the information available. So if the information is not available, how will citizens participate in the decision-making processes? Um, the previous speaker uh, speakers mentioned the um, access to, to information is the difference between life and death. I also add that um, Without access to information, uh, we can't realize the sustainable development goals. I would also want to uh, uh, bring out this. Are uh, the regional me mechanisms doing enough to compare national governments that uh, government to respond to citizen information needs? The countries that have not enacted access to information laws what, what are the plans in place to help them have the laws that are pro-citizens? The general lack of awareness about access to information legal framework among citizens and public officials makes it difficult for citizens to engage public institutions to demand for their rights. Access to information is a fundamental human right and is a cornerstone for enjoyment of other rights. It's an oxygen to realization of other rights. There is lack of implementation of access to information laws and compliance to the regulations. When, uh, when the laws are taking, are saying provide citizens with information and you are taking more than 21 days minus giving out the information, are you really responding to the compliance requirements? There is a significant number of countries without the laws, as already indicated, and also there is limited responsiveness and feedback mechanisms regarding the access to information, reporting, and implementation status of the right to information across the AU members. There is limited capacity of government stakeholders to implement and follow up government uh, and follow up citizens' demand. Members, um, this presentation has been making a lot of questions. These questions are supposed to be answered as uh, we think of realizing the realization of the sustainable development goals. I want to end up uh, by making uh, 
a few recommendations or yes, I would uh, make a few recommendations. One of the recommendations is about uh, Um, the UNESCO and its partners should continue to support state members and other stakeholders support the promotion and realization of the sustainable development goals. Member states should comply with the international and regional frameworks on access to information. Member state without specific laws on access to information should enact the laws on access to information and development partners. I encouraged, um, there is need to have capacity building for civil society organizations to demand and uh, engage government for the realization of the laws. I would like to extend my sincere thanks for inviting us to participate in this discussion. But um, I want also to observe that access to information is very critical in realization of the sustainable development goals. Thank you. All right, uh, all right. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Matthew Messige. Uh, thank you for the excellent arguments uh, you gave us, uh, and we hope that others have also helped a lot. Uh, so thank you so much. And uh, uh, I want to remind again uh, the, um, uh, the audience to keep uh, addressing your questions. Uh, I mean, to, to, to keep uh, writing uh, your questions in chat so that we, we can get uh, back to you in a few minutes. Yeah, so um, in returning to the international level on access to information, we would like um, to let you know that the right to information law for every individual is uh, recognized uh, by international human rights instruments, such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, and the International Conven Covenant uh, on Civil and Political Rights. Have for, have for long recognized this fundamental human right. Yeah. So the UN Human Rights Council has a long history of access to information, and there are also resolutions known as the Universal Periodic Review, which are often given to countries, including Rwanda, to implement it, which are, point, uh, which are pointing on the right to information. The Universal Periodic Review was created by the General Assembly in 2006 and uh, is carried out by an intergovernmental working group of Human Rights Council. The objective of um, the UPRI is to review um, uh, is to review the fulfillment of the human rights uh, commitment and obligations of all uh, 193 UN members uh, and uh, one of the UPRA regarding to the right of information and Rwanda is the number 6.56 concerning to the increase of public awareness on uh, media, poli uh, media policy and other various laws and regulations in uh, in a place uh, to expand media freedom. So this uh, was the recommendation provided by Maldives. Uh, so I would like to know more about the relationship between UPRA, uh, not only me, but even the audience. Yeah, we would like to know more about the relationship between UPRA and the right to, uh, to information. So in the help with uh, Mr. Mudekikwa, we are going to have more about it. Um, so before uh, he dive in, I would like to, to let you know who Mudakikwa is. He's a lawyer and executive director uh, and founder of Center for, for Rule of Law Random. He is a specialist on creation and implementation of the Universal uh, Periodic uh, Review. So ladies and gentlemen, help me to welcome John Mudakikwa. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you. You're most welcome.
Thank you very much. Um, yes. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much, Divine. Thanks very much, uh, everybody. Uh, again, um, yeah, happy International Day on Universal Access to Information. Um, as I've said, I'm called John Mudachikwa and um, the ex Executive Director of Center for Rule of Law Rwanda. Um, the Center for Rule of Rwanda is uh, a non-profit organization in Rwanda, which basically uh, its mission is to promote or uh, strengthen the culture of rule of law. And um, one of the areas we are working on is actually um, uh, the UPR, uh, uh, monitoring, influencing, advocacy. And I'm happy to say that we have a network uh, called the Rule of Law Alliance, which actually uh, the Rwanda uh, RGSD is, is a member of a founding member of that network. So again, thanks very much for inviting me to share my thoughts uh, on um, the UPR. Um, uh, the topic I've been asked to talk about is straightening the right of access to information in universal uh, periodic review. And um, I have some few slides prepared. Uh, I think some are going to be screened on a uh, uh, screenshot. So um, we may want to know what the UPR is. Uh, thanks to Vinny, you've touched about it uh, a little bit. Uh, the Universal Periodic Review is a unique process, as they say, which involves a periodic review of human rights records of all 193 UN member states. Uh, it's actually one of the most comprehensive uh, the most comprehensive um, mechanism. Uh, as you may know, there are other different mechanisms of monitoring and reporting about human rights uh, at the level of the treaty bodies or special procedures. Uh, but this one brings together um, all, hum all human rights um, uh, evaluated at, in like say a one-stop center format. So all the rights, civil, political, economic, specific rights, specific groups, all of them are evaluated or are monitored or assessed in one mechanism. So that's the UPR. And the UPR, as uh, Vina said, was established um, when the Human Rights Council was being created uh, on 15th March 2006 by the UN General Assembly, by Resolution 6051. And the first cycle of UPR started in 2007, okay? Uh, so that was after one year uh, when uh, the, the human rights um, the UPR mechanism was created. And since then, until to date, I would say that all countries, including Rwanda, have undergone uh, the UPR review um, three times or three cycles. Um, all countries must be reviewed, must be reviewed at least every four to five years. Uh, so that means that um, in that period, uh, every year countries are reviewed and within a period ranging from four to five years, all countries should be evaluated or monitored in one cycle, okay? Um, what's the goal of UPR? <clears throat> the goal of UPR is improvement of the human rights situation um, in every country with significant consequences for people around the globe. Now, um, it should be realized that this mechanism um, the way it's perceived, um, it, 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 is, it should be understood as a mechanism which helps countries, peer countries to evaluate themselves. But the ultimate goal really is to improve the human rights situation in every country. So the UPR is designed to prompt support and expand the promotion and protection of human rights on the ground, okay? So um, to achieve this, the country, every country uh, is assessed to see how they can address human rights violations wherever they can occur or where, where there are gaps, uh, countries assessed so that they are given recommendations. We'll come to that one later. So countries is assessed and then recommendations are given on areas where peer countries think there are gaps to improve. So the UPR also aims to provide technical assistance to states and enhance their capacity to deal effectively with human rights challenges. 
and share best practice in the field of human rights among states and other stakeholders. Now, it's not only just assess or to criticize or to challenge, but also um, this mechanism and enables um, countries, uh, peer countries, to uh, or the, the, the Human Rights Council and the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights to help countries address gaps where they think they need some technical support. Uh, but also, it's a forum for countries to showcase their best practices on how they have been. Uh, uh addressing different human rights challenges okay so it's a peer review mechanism as you care from its name the university review mechanism and countries and the un system the office of the human rights commission help countries to address uh different um human rights issues now on the basis of the upr review uh what you need to know is that upr is um is based on three major reports the first one is what they call the national or state report so here every country is provided an opportunity to provide a report on how they have improved human rights situation in their country normally uh, with as the cycles go on this national report is based on the previous recommendations which countries were given to address so the country basically is telling um uh the un system or the human rights council that look this recommendation was given this is what we have done to improve the situation on every recommendation and as you may know also is that when the countries do get these recommendations they work out on what they call an implementation roadmap which basically is an action plan of what is going to be done on every recommendation which the country accepts so um on basis of that report and on the recommendations and the, the implementation roadmap, a country can report to peer uh, countries that, look, this is what you have done on, uh, you had a recommendation saying we should strengthen um, uh, access to information law, uh, enjoyment, okay, this is what we have done. We have reformed the law, we have put up the law, we have put up you know, office in charge of uh, Buddhism is supposed to follow up on the um, access to information law. So countries are reporting on what they have done, they have done on each and uh, each recommendation. So in that, that report, um, then besides that report, uh, also member states or uh, the Human Rights Council look at uh, what they call compilation of information from UN agencies. So different UN agencies operating in the country and what they call UN, uh, UN uh, special procedures, basically involving uh, human rights rapporteur or treaty bodies, uh, uh, concluding observations, all this information is compiled in one report and which portrays how the UN mechanism perceives the human rights situation in the country. And this, again, cuts across all different human rights issues. Can be from children's rights, uh, disability rights, civil and political rights, everything, name them. And then, interestingly, there's also what they call Summer of Stakeholders Report. And this is a compilation from uh, what they call shadow reports uh, submitted by civil society organizations on how they perceive the situation of human rights in the country. Um, I would say, like the previous review, which I, uh, was just concluded this year, we had um, organization over 100 civil society organizations working individually or in coalitions submitted different shadow reports or what they call submissions to the human rights council on how they see the situation of human rights so all these reports are compiled plus uh, the report from the national human rights commission or what they call national human rights institution of the country so all this information is compiled into one document and these doc the three reports are assessed to either appreciate progress made or highlight areas where there are still gaps for a country to improve, which is known as the recommendations. Okay. So Rwanda and the UPR mechanism. What you just need to know um, is that uh, Rwanda has been reviewed uh, three times uh, in 2011, in 2015, and recently uh, in January 2021 in the third cycle. So just for your information, uh, in this, during the, the third cycle, Rwanda received 284 recommendations in total. 
So these are recommendations given, actually 99 countries participated in Rwanda's review and they gave 284 recommendations. And these recommendations, if you look at them, they cut across all human rights issues, okay? As I said, from civil political rights, economic rights, women's rights, children's rights, people with disability rights, everything. And now, as they even, the, the system that works is that countries have a right to take three positions on the recommendations given. One, they support, they may support the recommendation. And when you say they support or accept the recommendation, that means that these are recommendations, the government will say, yes, we agree with this. And you are going to take concrete action steps in the roadmap to implement these recommendations so that there's improvement. And we want to report on these recommendations during the next cycle. So in the, the out of 284 recommendations, Rwanda accepted 160 recommendations. They noted 75 recommendations. Now, when they say they note recommendation, it's just saying, okay, we accept that recommendation, but we are not going to take concrete steps because we think it's already under implementation or have already been accomplished. So there are no actions. They're not going, they're not obliged to report on them, though they take note of that recommendation as um, valid. Now, the most tricky ones are they for what they call recommendations which don't enjoy the support of a country. So in this review, 49 recommendations do not enjoy the support of Rwanda. What does that one mean? It means that um, these recommendations, a country feels they are not justified, they are not but they are based on inaccurate information and they are not going to be, they, there is no measure they can take to implement them. Okay. So 49 recommendations not support, the, uh, did not enjoy the support of Rwanda. Now, uh, just talk about a little bit about the right to freedom of expression, including access to information and the Rwanda Thugs um, UK review. Uh, I, and of course, during the upcoming fourth uh, UPR cycle, just to inform you that after the third cycle has now completed, is now uh, is over. Now we are entering the fourth cycle. Uh, now, based on the recommendations which Rwanda accepted or government accepted, the one sixty recommendations, uh, it's very important to note that um, uh, the right access to information. Um, as a key component, of course, of the right to freedom of expression as provided for under Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil Rights, which basically says everyone shall have the right to freedom of expression, and this right shall include freedom to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kinds, regardless of all uh, of frontiers, either orally, in writing, or in print, in form of art, or through any other media of, of his choice. Uh, that's Article 19, Paragraph 2 specifically. Uh, I would like to say that from with this general um, uh, definition of the freedom of expression and access to information as part of freedom of expression, I would say that um, uh, during the recent review, uh, the freedom of expression, uh, including access to information, was am were among the contentious uh, areas where Rwanda received a significant number of recommendations. Okay, so there were many uh, countries. Uh, which made recommendations in line to improving the situation of freedom of expression in general, and of course, interpreted broadly, including right to access to information. Uh, most of the recommendations on freedom of expression called for revision of the existing legal policy and institutional reforms. Okay, so as you may, as I did get some of the recommendations were made, uh, you find that. Uh, while countries were, were appreciating progress made, for example, on uh, media reforms which were conducted, uh, but there were still uh, recommendations calling for more policy reforms, uh, more institutional safeguards uh, to ensure that people enjoy the, the freedom of expression and act the right to access to information. Uh, just to show you, uh, I was just reviewing uh, um, uh, the outcome report, what they call the outcome report of the working group on universal periodic review, uh, which you can also access on that link. You'll find that um, um, around 12 recommendations, 12 or 13 recommendations uh, talk about, we're talking about uh, freedom of expression in general. Uh, 
among those which were accepted by Rwanda. And six recommendations around freedom of expression were noted, and two recommendations uh, did not enjoy the support of Rwanda. And just to show you some of these recommendations, for example, which are very interesting for you maybe to look at, would be, for example, recommendation uh, 134.62, to protect the journalists to work freely without fear of retribution and ensure that state authorities comply with the access to information law. This was a recommendation made by the United Kingdom of Britain and Northern Ireland. Another recommendation 55 talks about the protection of journalists against harassment and, elim and eliminate from legislation all provisions that undermine freedom of expression and intimidation. Okay, that was a recommendation by uh, Lithuania. Uh, there's another recommendation 57 continue implementing reforms aimed at expanding media freedoms and creating a citizen centered media to ensure that all individuals fully enjoy the right to freedom of expression. That was made by the Republic of Korea. There's also one called continue to strengthen the legal system in order to ensure freedom of expression and freedom of association and assembly, uh, continue efforts to guarantee the right of freedom of opinion and expression, including by allowing greater access to independent news outlets. Um, so there are many recommendations, as you see, around, as uh, I said, around 6, 12 recommendations, which were made by, uh, which were accepted by Rwanda. Now, what does that mean in terms of practical uh, uh, um, uh, things? So how can we straight, and that comes to the question of how can we straight, uh, uh, straighten the right to access to information through UPR? Now, uh, during now, this one, I think uh, the most interesting thing to reflect uh, is that UPR has two phases. Uh, there's during the implementation of the UPR, uh, which we have now started. I mean, Rwanda now we have entered the fourth cycle. So we have started the implementation process of the recommendations. So in this phase, I think what's very most interesting would be to disseminate the right access to information to different rights holders through different channels. Now, we have had a lot of, uh, uh, from the previous speakers, Matthew and Emmanuel were talking about where the gaps could be in terms of access to information. I think the UPR has set a very good, good framework to pursue um, some of these recommendations in relation to access to information with the ability to improve the situation. So based on the recommendations which were accepted by the government of Rwanda, there is room to disseminate uh, more information about the right access to information through different channels to rights holders. I think that would be contributing directly to help the government to implement, uh, to disseminate, to raise awareness about this right. Another thing which is very interesting, maybe which you could think about uh, critically is to conduct evidence-based advocacy for legal, policy and institutional reforms necessary to advance the right information based on accepted and noted recommendations. I think this is one of the central areas where we need to look at critically. Now, the UPR, as I said, has provided a framework. One of the recommendations accepted is to conduct an audit uh, or uh, assessment to see any gaps which may infringe on the right to freedom of expression. And of course, that includes also access to information and see where the gaps. And based on that, pursue rigorously different advocacy interventions. I had, I've had, for example, Emmanuel talking about the access to information or having a gap in relation to um, lack of sanctions to people who fail to provide information. All these gaps, which we think inhibit the enjoyment of right access to information. This is an opportunity to based on the UPR to do this research and do evidence-based advocacy and engage the government. Look, these, low, these gaps are missing. So by the end of this cycle, the four years, at least it's good, we should expect that some of these gaps in terms of access to information are addressed, okay? Now, another interesting thing is to monitor, document, uh, various abuses rated the right access to information, okay? Now, within the framework of UPR, it's very interesting to see how we can, as civil society, as different stakeholders can monitor 
document various uh, gaps, abuses, uh, things which are not working in relation to access to information. If, if journalists or people are not getting uh, information, how many cases are we talking about? What has the Ombudsman done? This information is interesting. It's important to document it so that we use it to engage in different, with different duty bearers to address any abuses or gaps identified. So again, within the framework of UPR, that would be interesting to see how uh, we can engage as civil society, as other stakeholders, uh, to see or the media fraternity, to see how uh, uh, issues related with access to information gaps can be addressed, okay? So um, that would be interesting. Now another slide, maybe I don't know if, if on the screenshot, but I have another slide of how about, how about during the review process? Now I talk, I've talked about um, strengthening, uh, strengthening our role in terms of during implementation. So during the four years, we have opportunity to work on all the advocacy, to advocate for different reforms, to disseminate. Uh, people know about access to information law, uh, the rights accruing to that. But the most critical part, again, is during the review process. Now, as I said, every after four and a half to five years, the government of Rwanda will again be reviewed. Okay. So maybe that's around 20, uh, 25 or 26. Rwanda is going to be reviewed again. Now, during the phase of review, um, and I also just mentioned that review can be midterm or end of cycle. So midterm, that means after two and a half years, we can, um, government can submit what they call a midterm report, but that's not mandatory. But media, civil society, for them, they are allowed to, if they want to do a midterm report, they can report on the progress in the two and a half years, what has happened. So there's during the midterm or at the end of the cycle, we have an opportunity to basically uh, report on what progress has been made. What have we achieved? How far, how many laws have been uh, modified to make sure that they are compliant with access to information? Um, in that period, what, what is remaining? So during the review, we have an opportunity to report on what worked, what, what was made in terms of progress realized, but also have a chance to indicate what is still missing, what are the other gaps, so that that can inform, again, recommendations for the fifth cycle. So as I said, the, the UPR is a cycle. It goes around and around. So if there's still some gaps, we see that by around 2026, nothing, there are some things which have not been implemented. We have an opportunity to keep, again, pushing or advocating uh, for the recommendations. I mean, for new... Uh, uh, to, to adopt new recommendations. Uh, civil society organizations are encouraged to submit what they call alternative reports, okay? Uh, basically, these are op op uh, our, our reports submitted by civil society to show uh, where they stand in terms of, um, in terms of um, uh, progress made and remaining challenges on direct access to information. And also at this level, we can engage different UN agencies uh, to make sure that uh, issues raised or issues we see are still missing. They can be also included in their reports. As I said, uh, their reports is also considered during the review process. Uh, so uh, different uh, through the different UN mechanisms, we can engage them, but also they can be lobby meetings to ensure that uh, recommending states, what they say, uh, I mean, the UN member states, which make recommendations, you can engage them and tell them, look, we still have some challenges here and there. I think we should, you should make these recommendations to improve through expression of the right to access to information. So with that, I think that's how we have to uh, engage with the UPR mechanism. And just conclude, I would want to emphasize that the UPR mechanism, uh, as I said, one, it's a one-stop center. It's a one-stop mechanism where you can um, engage advocate for any human rights any human rights as embedded in the human rights conventions, uh, the core UN human rights conventions you know about, uh, the UN Charter and other UN accepted or customary international human rights principles. And it's also, there's now an increasing connection 
uh, the UN is working on a mechanism how they can con uh, they, how they can link the UPR to the SDGs, okay? So that in, uh, actually as you report on UPR, uh, corresponding rights which apply also to SDGs are uh, also uh, the different data you using or uh, progress being realized can also be reflected uh, when it comes to evaluating the implementation of SDGs. So uh, it's a mechanism which I would encourage everybody really to uh, be interested in, uh, engage with. It's an open process um, uh, so that our views, our voice can be heard in terms of very emerging issues related to access to information law. Thank you. All right, all right, all right. Thank you so much. Oh, sensational, sensational. Yeah, um, thank you very much uh, for the excellent uh, arguments, uh, actually. Thank you for all panelists for this uh, engaging uh, um, uh, presentation that uh, all of you have shared with us. Uh, and um, it, this is so amazing. This is so amazing. We learned a lot. We learned a lot. Um, so uh, we would like, first of all, to take a, a short break uh, of uh, seconds, not even a minute. We would like to call everyone to put on his video, to put on his camera so that we can all, uh, so that we can take a picture. Mm, yes, uh, so that we can take a picture and, um, and then we proceed with uh, our second session where we uh, delivering um, our uh, questions yeah. uh, so that uh, our panelists that uh, we have um, can uh, uh, give us, can share, um, can share to us more about the um, questions that um, delivered. So uh, I think uh, to there, first listen, please. Um, we need to take me a picture. To Yes, yes, everyone, yes, yes. Please, I'm calling yes. everyone, please, I'm calling you to your camera. Put, you can turn on your camera. Turn on your camera. So as we are not, uh, uh, we are online, so we can do snaps. So we see everyone is ready, maybe. Synapse to the speakers if you can. Yes, I don't see synapse to everyone. Yes, yes, okay. So, uh, ready, steady. Yeah, ready. Yes, yes, we are ready. Yes, we are ready. One, two, three, go. Thank you. All right. All right, all right, thank you. All again. right, thank you again. Uh, so thank listen, you. Uh, uh, so listen, yes, um, uh, thank you very much. Yes, a very great. Thank you, guys, very great. And I'm uh, calling everyone to your phone. Yes, thank you much. And um, uh, so I, I wanted to get into. Um, to turn into messages, uh, I, I would like to know if uh, all the panelists, I do believe that uh, you're still there. <laughs> I do believe that you're still there. And uh, the first uh, question uh, goes to Berna Namata. Uh, are you there? Yes. Uh, uh, the first question um, uh, came from uh, Haran Mwangi. Uh, he said uh, that if information is a public good, enabling people to make decision about their livelihood and um, to determine their destiny. How should we address uh, the challenge of cost of production of content? What should be the role of the government in providing subsidies uh, to content pro producers? And uh, the se his qu second question uh, was uh, production and supply of content uh, is one of the thing, but up, um, he said that, yeah, production and supply of uh, content is one thing, but uptake um, and all content used by citizens is the other. How should we handle the question of uh, meal? Should we have a national campaign and a clear policy on this? Uh, who should lead uh, the process? I think we, I think uh, Namata, you, you've already got the question.
question? Yeah, do you uh, want me to respond? Yes, yes, like right away, thank you. Okay, um, thank you so much uh, for, for that question. Uh, I'll begin with the second part of your question. Um, should we have a national campaign and a clear policy? Absolutely, yes. Um, we need a national campaign and, and policy. Um, and who should lead the process? I think, uh, first of all, we need to acknowledge that we have a gap in terms of uh, media literacy, uh, for instance. Um, we don't yet have uh, a fully informed uh, citizenry in terms of um, understanding the media, um, who are the journalists, um, and increasingly so, this is a big challenge uh, because we have all sorts of content producers and what we have seen uh, in recent um, months, for instance, is we have people called YouTubers who just because they could, you know, they produce content, we have people referring to them as journalists. So if you were to ask me the beginning point, I think uh, would be media literacy. Uh, for people to be able to distinguish uh, professional content providers, uh, if I may say that. Uh, secondly, also in terms of uh, awareness, of course, uh, about the legal text, uh, I think the previous uh, speakers uh, underscored that. Uh, you really need ordinary citizens to understand, uh, one, the legal text, uh, to understand their, their rights, but also obligations uh, in this whole process of uh, improving access uh, to information. Uh, the second part of your question on the challenge of uh, production. Now, this is, of course, uh, a global problem, uh, to more so for our part of the world, uh, the, the developing world. Um, we've come under a lot of pressure, newsrooms are under a lot of pressure, and more so for local outlets. And we have seen that uh, the pandemic has actually worsened the situation for local, local content production uh, because most of them were thrown out of business uh, completely. You have a few that are still uh, limping. So part of the solution in my view lies in um, government uh, providing some form of incentives, uh, for instance, tax relief, uh, we still know that, uh, for instance, uh, I know this from our newsroom, uh, payroll taxes are quite high. Uh, that uh, makes it difficult uh, for newsroom operations. But on the other hand, um, the delicate balance, of course, is if government is funding you, would you still be free of interest? Uh, would you still be independent, you know, as a, as a content producer? Uh, so... I don't have an answer for that, uh, but we know that it is possible that uh, government can come in and, and help. And we are already seeing that um, on our market, on the Rwandan market, uh, for instance, we know that recently, and uh, I think this is the second phase, um, RMC, UNDP, uh, and the Rwanda Governance Board have had uh, local grants uh, for, they have had grants for local media houses uh, to support them uh, to produce content. But of course, most of it was specifically earmarked for, for the pandemic. Now, going forward, as we exit uh, the pandemic, we don't know if these newsrooms, uh, local outlets can be able to survive without the small grants that uh, they are getting. So the challenge right now, if you ask me again around content production is new revenue models, you know, um, the media ecosystem has changed. Uh, it has been disrupted uh, by technology. So how media, the different media outlets adapt to that uh, is, is also an ongoing challenge that needs to be addressed. I hope I've answered your question. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Namata. And uh, of course, uh, let me uh, check uh, the second question um, from, um, uh, excuse me, from Benjamin. 
yes the second question was from benjamin and uh, he was uh, he he was saying that uh, my question goes to Mr. Emmanuel Habomoremi. Uh, his question was, uh, he was like uh, the law of eight, uh, of eight, eight, 18th, yeah, February 2013 on access to information in Rwanda does not appear to be being implemented. What do you think is being done to ensure that the beneficiaries uh, comply with the provisions of the the law as it is harmful to many things and is often beneficial to the people. Uh, Mr. Emmanuel Hawemuremi, uh, the question goes to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank uh, I'm thanking uh, Benjamin for the, the question. Uh, my first of, uh, impression, uh, I was wondering uh, whether I can know the time uh, Benjamin has started uh, uh, working in the media sector, uh, because when looking at back in the period before the access to information law, media practitioners were really, really struggling to access officials and the information they hold. And uh, media, uh, media practitioners are among the, person, uh, the, the first people who raised their voice and claimed to have an access to information law. We, it's coming, we have observed some behavior change in government institution on how uh, they provide information. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, they know that this is an obligation because it is stated in the law. Uh, the establishment of a post of speak, uh, speak, uh, spokesperson uh, within the government institution and PR officers is also another thing which has facilitated uh, the access to uh, information. And uh, there is another thing which we have observed. The government has issued instructions, especially prime minister, to all public institutions to closer work with the media. Uh, maybe you can remember in 2015 and 16, where uh, there was this move of meet the minister of uh, such and such a ministry. This was one kind of facilitating uh, media uh, uh, to get information from what these people are doing. Uh, there is another uh, phenomenon that we cannot forget the use of social media in the government also put a push to the government officials to consider providing feedback to the public request in, in, as an, account, uh, an accountability measure. But also we have seen some initiative by stakeholders in the media from civil society, media, government, uh, to build the capacity of local government uh, uh, on awareness, uh, on uh, building the capacity on awareness on uh, access to information law. But uh, we can ask ourselves, but uh, are all these really enough? Uh, based uh, coming back to what John has mentioned, really, we need to look at these uh, UPR recommendations. Uh, when implemented, there will be most of the solutions on question we are asking ourselves. But also, as Namata uh, has mentioned, we need more educating the public so that they fully know uh, the access to information is their absolute right. But also, we, uh, uh, we have seen some complaints from government officials or private sector officials saying that when they provide information, some media distort them. So we need. Uh, on ourselves, uh, on our side, to uh, make sure that the, the information they provide are uh, faithfully uh, uh, used. So this is what I can think about the question he has uh, uh, asked. Thank you. All right, all right. Thank you so much. Uh, before we proceed uh, with the following questions, I would like first of all to give uh, time um, the uh, to Mr. Celestin. 
Yeah, he has uh, a question to ask. To listen, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, thank you for the speakers. Um, my first question goes to Emmanuel. Um, uh, Emmanuel, uh, it's a great uh, an honor to have you as you have been uh, in the media for a long time, reforms and uh, putting everything together. Uh, my question is, what uh, I, your organization is doing to protect uh, journalists to have access to information? For example, the century we had the, we has um, we had an issue, which it's we don't have an issue. There's one of the journalists uh, who approached the High Court, the Rwanda Court, to ask transform to, to, to the updating the access to information. That shows that it is clear in Rwanda, most many institutions, specifically government institutions, they don't give information for journalists. According to how um, Matthew said, in Uganda, they take 21 days. So in Rwanda, you, you send an email, they don't reply you. You send another one, they don't reply you. The fight comes on Twitter where you need to tweet RIMC, you need to tweet uh, IRJ, you need to tweet uh, the institution so they see in the public in order to act. So what the measures the RLJ are you having to protect and support and help journalists to have access to information. And uh, the next question uh, goes to, to Bana. Bana uh, Namata, you mentioned uh, something about everyone has led to information. We have had um, many press conferences organized in, a, in Rwanda and some of press conferences, they will invite a uh, big media so this means that big media, they have access to information than small media, where I think the small media will copy paste from uh, the big media's website or news platforms to publish to their, to their um, platforms. That's where I think there is misinformation or disinformation coming. So for you, what do you think uh, need to be done in order for the younger upcoming journalists to have access to information fully uh, on a big um, uh, conferences. The last one go, uh, goes to Matthews. As an African freedom, um, uh, freedom of access to information, you mentioned how many countries you operate on. And we have heard that there are some countries who adapted and signed access to information law, and there are some other countries who don't. So um, what is your organization is doing to uh, empower uh, or collaborate with the governments to establish the internet, the access to information law? And how are women are uh, engaging in uh, knowing more about access to information law as many can fight to find information but we know women may have challenges. How are you encouraging women to adopt also the use to, to access information law? Thank you so much. Thank you for the question you, you asked me uh, on what uh, ARJ is doing to protect the journalists on access to information uh, abuse, if I can, I, I can call it like that. Uh, as you know, uh, as a member of a civil state organization, ARJ is uh, advocating for the right, uh, the, the press freedom right. Uh, when we look at the the laws in place, we don't, we don't pick only one, but we look at uh, the whole uh, system, media system uh, holistically. Uh, as you know, we have uh, a media policy which, uh, uh, which has 
which has been in place more than uh, about 10 years. So this is a policy that needs to be uh, improved. There are some laws and some provision in the laws that need to be uh, 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 improved. So uh, we, at the moment, we are discussing with different stakeholders, uh, among whom are uh, government institutions and uh, social health organizations, to look at how all these identified gaps in uh, uh, legal uh, framework in Rwanda can be improved. And uh, uh, having a, a journalist who can uh, ad, uh, write and uh, ask for correction of something which hinder his, uh, his uh, activities, in my opinion, there is no problem. He can do it, but uh, uh, on our side, we look at the whole system holistically and look at how this can be corrected uh, at the same time, as you know, the policy, first of all, is the one which states some laws that can be uh, implement this policy. Having the policy uh, improved, it will help us to have all these laws uh, 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 corrected, in, if I can uh, call it like that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, I appreciate. All right, all right, thank you so much. Can I respond? Yes, yes, Bana, go ahead, thank you. Okay, um, thank you so much for that question. Uh, though I, I don't think I'm the right person to ask. The people who organize the press conferences ideally should be the ones <laughs> to respond uh, because I imagine they, they have a criteria, uh, but I would attempt uh, to, to respond to it. Um, one, I, I think that um, for young uh, upcoming journalists, what is important is not so much to, you know, to, to attend, the, to be invited to attend the press briefings. I think what you want to do or focus on what is within your control is to build a profile that forces the people who are organizing these press conferences to invite you, you know, or simply put a new place on the table. So I would imagine when you're just starting out, uh, most of the time uh, you're not yet visible. And so it could be that people are not even aware of your potential or what you can do. That is one um, issue. The second one I would imagine is that people who organize press conferences have um, interests. And perhaps it could be the audience of the particular um, media house, uh, the rich. So in this case, if you are a small outlet, perhaps you don't have uh, a significant audience that would be of the interest to the person who is organizing a press briefing, for instance. The other issue is also influence. Um, I think we have to accept the reality that not all of us, um, not all our media outlets are influential. Um, the challenge is even bigger when you're small and you're still um, starting out. And for that, uh, I would think the priority for young journalists and, and their outlets is to focus on how you produce content that makes you influential. And influential is not so much about generating so much work. No, it is if you do one piece and you do it so well and it's influential, I'm very sure that you, they will not ignore you. The third aspect would also be uh, credibility and also the profile of, of, of the media personality or the journalists uh, at hand. Um, for small or emerging uh, media, it takes time to, to build a profile. And I would think that you earn your place on the table based on the profile of your work. And this takes time, you know, it, it really takes time for, for you to uh, emerge um, because someone will also make reference uh, to the kind of work that you're doing. So again, my appeal 
to upcoming uh, journalists with uh, outlets, use your space deliberately and carefully thinking about how that enhances your profession or your career goals. With time, if you improve your profile, establish your profile as a journalist who is credible, who disseminates um, credible information, who is independent, um, free of interests, uh, which is not easy. I think the question of getting invited uh, can be addressed in a way, but of course, again, like I said, uh, better to ask that question to the people who organize uh, these briefings. Thank you so much. Thank you so all much. Right, all right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Berna. Uh, thank you for uh, the great uh, you are sharing that. The younger to follow this, uh, this is watching more. And um, uh, so great. Uh, I would like to get into a chat again. And um, uh, here we have Haran Mwangi. Uh, his comment, uh, he said that, uh, thank you, Berna. We have a lot Excuse to do. Excuse me, David. My, my, last Sorry, question, my last question was to, my last question was to uh, Mwesige, if you, he's there, he can also respond. I ask Okay, that. let me, okay, allow me to, 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 to finish with this um, comment and one question, and then he can res get, uh, respond uh, back to you, if you don't mind. I think he's ready. He, he had uh, understood your question. So uh, I was uh, saying that uh, Haron Mwangi said that, thank you, Berna. We have a lot to do to support the media and to educate the citizens. And um, another question uh, from Joseph Iradukunda uh, from RGSD um, said that, uh, what can Rwanda do to make? And this question, by the way, goes to Emmanuel uh, from ARG. I think uh, he's there. Yeah, so the question was from uh, Joseph Iradukunda and he asked uh, Emmanuel that, what can Rwanda do to make, uh, to make sure young people have access to information? Mostly young people are facing a, ch uh, a challenge of accessing um, information. So that was the question. And uh, uh, Celestine, your question, I think now it can be responded. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Celestine. Yes, uh, I would like uh, to respond to your questions and uh, also building on what uh, Bena has said. Um, it's very important to write stories using the available data that is verified. And when there are pieces um, of work come out very strong, people will start looking for you as she has indicated. So what you need to do, uh, I don't know whether the um, Access to Information Act of, of Rwanda has a provision for the information request. So make use of the information request to request for information that uh, can help you build your cases your stories, then you'll come out strongly. Okay, regarding to uh, the questions you asked, I think um, we are a Pan-African um, organization. We have membership in 21 countries, in 26 countries. I work majorly uh, looks on advocating for adoption of access to, inform access to information law. Uh, recently, we worked with the, the Gambia to come up with our access to information law. I think on the African continent, uh, the Gambia is the latest country to have access to information laws. Then uh, we also work with the member organizations from different countries to execute our work, uh, building a capacity 
of um, different actors to um, on access to information. This helps to access information from uh, government entities. Additionally, it helps us to, to advocate for implementation of the laws uh, that are, have already been passed. Uh, that is on um, how we're doing, uh, how we're empowering the members to implement the access to information law. Regarding the issue of inclusion, uh, specifically on women, we, as I indicated, we do capacity building. We develop capacity for women to have knowledge of access to information. Then uh, with that knowledge, they also get involved in requesting for information from government, which helps them to participate. We have the ongoing research that also looks at uh, the women in participation in uh, the procurement processes and the like. These kind of researches help us to identify the gaps for advocacy, which informs our advocacy agenda. Then, um, as also indicated, we support the ratification of the access to information laws on the continent. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, I think now, Emmanuel, are you ready to respond to the question? Thank you very much. All right. Thank uh, and, and thank you for the question on what Rwanda can do to make sure the, that uh, Rwandan uh, youth who are uh, journalists can access to information. First of all, uh, ARJ in its capacity, it has to, uh, to build their capacity on how to acquire the information and build their self-confidence when they are in front of, uh, of the source of information, which is among of, uh, one of the uh, activities we do in building the capacity of media sector. Uh, here, uh, I can let you know that uh, at the moment, instead of training people uh, in having all people in all things, uh, this is really hindering having uh, real professionals in media sector in Rwanda. So at the moment, we are looking at this, uh, training for senior journalists, training for middle journalists, and training for young journalists. And they can fit in this kind of category of, uh, of training. And we need to involve them in various activities that allow them to reach where uh, the source of information is. This is what we do when we work with different partners. Sometimes we work with them uh, by being trained, basing on uh, their expertise. After the, the training, journalists need to go to the ground, to the field, uh, to, to ensure that uh, what they have learned is put in, uh, into practice. So uh, we need to involve more young people in this kind of uh, uh, training. And then uh, we, need, uh, we link them with the experts from uh, different institutions uh, uh, to, to ensure that uh, they got sources or quotes uh, that uh, complement the information or complete the information they get from the, the, the ground. And having a, such kind of working environment with the young journalists, I think uh, uh, this will help them to increase their capacity on access to, it, to the information. And here I can mention that whenever they meet uh, a challenge, uh, we intervene in this area. Thank you very much. All right, all right. Thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, and, uh, excuse me. Uh, yes. 
uh, I wanted to, uh, to make a clarification somewhere. Yes, please. Yes, please go ahead. Yes. Uh, Celestine mentioned 21 days in Uganda to get information. Uh, in my presentation, I indicated that the law, uh, our law says 20, 21 days, but that one does not necessarily mean you have to wait for 21 days. The information can be given within the same day, the same minute, but it shouldn't exceed 20, 21 days. So the range is between one day and 21 days, but uh, to the extreme, it's when people can delay until 21 days. So I was saying, if someone has read a story and has to wait for 21 days, it's not appropriate, but it depends, it, it varies from one entity to the other, but the law gives us 21 days, knowing that the information can be in um, a department and the information you're requesting is maybe for three years back, which needs time to look for it. So the 21 days allows the entity to search, get the information if it is already archived, then um, they respond to you. But if the information is readily available, it can be provided to you within even a single day. And uh, the um, online platform uh, that are uh, also used to disseminate information that can help citizens participate in decision-making process, in the monitoring, in the governance processes. We have the government procurement portal where all the procurement information is supposed to be displayed online and people have been, um, have been um, accessing this information. We have Ask Your Gov, where people send in um, questions and requests where, people, where the government is able to respond. Then also the government nowadays uh, on Tuesday, the media center, the minister comes to give information that is coming from the cabinet um, discussion. You remember in my discussion, I indicated one of the exempted information is the cabinet record. But now, uh, because it was bringing a contention, so the government decided after a cabinet meeting, the following day, the minister responsible comes out to give the, the government position regarding the meeting. This helps people to keep moving forward with informed, um, informed inform with um, enough information. Um, the journalists are in called to participate in the press briefing. This in one way or the other, it helps to fight the issue of misinformation and uh, the fake news. Thank you. All right, all right. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, this, um, let me be quick to the last more question uh, that uh, has been uh, addressed to, uh, to Mudakikwa. Um, he said that uh, if journalists are complaining about the access to information law in Rwanda, what can be done to update it and how can both sides be involved? Involved. Um, so Mudakikwa, the floor is yours, please. And uh, let's try to use maybe like one minute and then we close. Thank you. Hello, Mudekikwa. Thank you, you very much. Right, yes. thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that question. Uh, I think uh, most of has been talked about. Been... Um, what we need to do is twofold. I think as people from the civil society, um, our main job is really to monitor and advocate for changes uh, where they are necessary. Uh, and uh, specifically, 
as I said earlier, within the UPR framework, we have room to document what's not working, it can be research um, on concretely on what's not working in terms of difficulties in accessing to information. One thing which is very concrete, for example, I have heard from these discussions is to have like, to advocate to have a maximum period of responding to, to requested information, okay? Um, they have also mentioned about things like lack of sanctions for people who don't respond. So if, they are, if we can advocate for these changes and we have some progress on, for example, putting in sanctions, on putting up a deadline of responding to um, uh, requests in the law, then it will, be, it will be more easier, I think, to enforce that law, to say, okay, we have a, 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 these reforms and they have to be implemented. So it should start with really documenting what is not working, work on very concrete advocacy agenda, and then we see, we hope there will be improvement in the future. Thank you. All right, all right, all right. Thank you so much. May I, may I add something? Yes, sure, sure. And just one minute, please. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, what I would uh, yes. um, add is um, uh, add, having uh, synergies is very important, but uh, having synergy is very important when you understand the law. And um, the recommendations that are coming from the UPR. So if those, if you have the law, understanding of the law, the recommendations of the UPR, and you develop synergies, you can create change. That's what I wanted to ask. Thank you. I think Divine lost. Uh, okay, no. she's got back. I, I'm she's here. Back. I'm here. Yeah, I thank you for everyone to your inputs, and uh, I would like to call upon Placid, uh, legal uh, representative of RRGST, to um, give us a close remark. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Welcome, Placid. Thank you so much, Devin, and thank you so much, everybody. Uh, we thank you all those who are able to attend this meeting, and uh, I hope we will continue to work together in this fight to, for the right to information. On behalf of RGSD, I'd like to thank you all our guest speakers of today. Uh, we thank you, Mr. John Okande from the, uh, from the com communication and information sector at the UNESCO Regional Office for East African. We thank you also, Mr. Matthew Mwesije from AFIC, Africa Freedom of Information Center. We thank you so much, Mrs. Banana Amata from the East African newspaper. Thank you so much, Mr. Emmanuel Havumuremi, the Executive Secretary of ARG. And thank you so much, Mr. John Mudachikwa, the Executive Director at Cellulo. Thank you so much. Uh, once again, thank you so much. Uh, your wonderful and informative presentation. Uh, to our members of RGSB, especially our upcoming journalists who are still in school at universities and all others who participated in this discussion. As I mentioned before, this is the second edition of RGSB's conference regarding to the advocacy awareness and promoting the right of access to information. And we are continuing to, such, uh, to do such activities because uh, as part of our main goal in RGSP, we want uh, Rwanda and other African countries to achieve sustainable development through to access to information at the right time. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, once again, thank you so much to attend and happy International Day for Universal Access to Information Day. Bye and have a good day. All right, thank, thank you, you so much. Uh, before, before everyone uh, gets, gets off, off uh, I would like just uh, to let you uh,
to let you know that we are going, of course, to share you the documents uh, of the presentations that has uh, been presented here. And I would like to request our presenters to help us and uh, in support with our leaders of RGST. They are going to help us to have all those documents so that we can uh, keep learning more. And thank you for being with us. Uh, and thank you for all, uh, all guests from uh, East African. Yeah, so thank you so much. We wish you all the best and stay, stay safe from COVID. Thank you so much. Stay well and have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.